Okay. So last time, uh, let me just see. Last time we didn't get as far as I wanted to get to because we got a bit digressed into some final points. Uh, so let me start today with a very simple quantum mechanic, just to get a bit reoriented. So let's consider a two-state system. So my goal is to basically introduce some of the essential ideas like entropy, uh, ensembles, and so on, which will be important for discussing quantum black holes and entropy. But in the simplest possible situation, <coughs> so we said that any physical system should correspond to a Hilbert space. So in this case, the Hilbert space is just two dimensional. And the Hamiltonian is therefore just a two by two matrix, Hermitian matrix, which I can diagonalize and which I will write it as so in fact, so all the discussions that we had about quantum mechanics, we can now state everything in a very explicitly. For example, I can define the state plus, which is just one zero, and state minus, which is zero one. So plus has eigenvalue plus E of the Hamiltonian. If you make a measurement of the Hamiltonian, I will get an answer plus E. And Similarly, if I measure it minus, I will get minus E. It's an extremely simple quantum mechanical system. But it's actually uh, is very, comes up a lot in uh, physics. Some of the context in which it comes is the spin systems. So you can have a particle with a spin up or down. That's a two-state system. A Fermi oscillator, which we will discuss shortly. So there is a analog of a Bose, Bose, the oscillator that we consider, there is a generalization of that, which is called a Fermi oscillator, which basically means whether the particle is present or not present. So that's also a two-state system. Then in quantum information theory is called a qubit and so on. So it's actually a, a good example to keep in mind. And then we can consider all the general axioms that we had discussed. For example, if I have a general state psi, then I can write it as a linear combination of this. And I'm going to take it to be unit, okay, so we take it to be unit norm. So a square plus b square is equal to one. And then this state is clearly not an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. So as I said, you have a Hilbert space, a physical system is represented by a Hilbert space, a state in a Hilbert space with a unit norm. And observables are represented by self-adjoint operators. And the probability of obtaining the result E so if you measure H on the state, is given by A square. And similarly, the probability of obtaining result minus E, it was given by B square. 
And now you can see why it's common in physics literature to normalize things, to use an orthonormal basis and to normalize things to one because in the orthonormal basis, I can just read off the probabilities just by looking at it. I just take the coefficient and take the absolute value square. That's the probability of finding this result. And moreover, because a square plus probabilities psi psi equal to one guarantees that we are dealing with normalized probabilities. Okay, so all, if I measure, if I take a large number of such uh, identical systems prepared in the same state and I measure repeatedly, what I will find is that absolute value A square times I will get result E, absolute value B square times I will get result minus E and A square plus B square is equal to 1, so the total probabilities add up to 1. So that's the reason for the way that's the reason for choosing a state with a unit norm and an orthonormal basis. And clearly here, these measurements will not depend on the overall phase of the state. And therefore, you, now you can of course uh, restate the whole thing without using an orthonormal basis and relaxing the unit norm. But, uh, if you normalize things this way, the physical interpretation is more transparent because you can just read off the probabilities. And moreover, you get no normalized probabilities. So last time we had a 15 minute discussion on this, but it was a bit of a digression. But the main ideas are I think illustrated here. And now let's take any ob all observables in the system identity and the Pauli matrices. They are proportional to, there are some real linear combinations of identity and the Pauli matrices, which is sigma 1 is equal to, sigma 2 is equal to, and sigma 3 is equal to, So our Hamiltonian is nothing but E times sigma 3. But you could choose some other observable A is equal to sigma 1, for example. And you might want to look at the eigenstates of that. Of course, this, as you know, is diagonal. You can diagonalize it. And let me denote those eigenvalues with arrows which have the property that eigenvalue of this is equal to plus 1 and eigenvalue of A on this state is minus 1. So this is a state with some eigenvalue minus 1. But now, if I measure the Hamiltonian on this system, then I will get a probability by this axioms. If I measure minus E with probability half. Right, because the coefficient of this is 1 over square root of 2. If I square it, the probability of obtaining the result plus E has probability half. The probability of result obtaining result minus E is probability half. And half plus half is equal to 1. And this is true for both these states. Even though there is a very important minus sign between the two. So here we said that the overall phase has no physical significance
We see that the relative phase clearly is important. And it's important not, of course, for the measurement of the Hamiltonian, because for the measurement of Hamiltonian, you cannot distinguish between this state and that state. But if you measured A, you'll, you'll be able to distinguish, because the, the one which has a plus sign here, will, with unit probability, will give you answer 1. And this, this one will give you the unit probability and answer minus 1. So these relative phases are really of absolutely critical importance in quantum mechanics. And there are two really weird things about quantum mechanics, which one must appreciate, is that A and B are called probability amplitudes. They are not probabilities, and they are complex numbers. And so, if you have some, what you, because the entire Hilbert space structure is linear at the level of the states and not at the level of the norm, in quantum mechanics, you add probability amplitudes. So if you have two alternative No, no, I'm not now adding vectors. I'm adding probability amplitudes for a process. It's no longer probability amplitude. Sorry? It's no longer probability amplitude. I don't understand. It's no longer probability. If you add A1 and A2 and B1. No, so. I agree with you. Uh, is everything clear up to this point, or do we still disagree about, about this? Everything is clear except the statement. Okay, now this statement is that is not about adding probability amplitude is not the same as vectors. Probability amplitude. A and B are Yeah, A and B are probability amplitudes. For what, pro for a process that A is the probability amplitude of finding the state psi, in this case, is A. After a measurement, Now let me Yes, no, I don't want to add A. So this, uh, if um, What we, okay, uh, let's see, how should I say this in the most, uh, if 
there are two inter if there are two alternatives to achieving the same result okay so if the system for example if the particle can go this way and come here and that way then you can associate with this process a probability amplitude a and the probability amplitude b if this was a classical particle what you will add is a square plus you will just add the unnormalized sorry uh, a square plus b square the probabilities you will add whereas in quantum mechanics what you will add is a plus b and then you will take the square so this is not the same as adding a square plus b square okay okay some of these i think some of these questions i think are more appropriate for a tutorial okay so i think we should probably discuss it because i'm trying to now present uh, a big chunk of the things in a minimal possible way so if this point is not clear let's make a note of it and we'll come back to it in a tutorial i mean i'll be happy to take a tutorial on this after afterwards okay but the two important point is that uh, the hilbert space structure is for these states whereas the probability uh, requires to take you absolute value square so probabilities are defined as i told you by taking this expectation value of a projector and if the state is normalized to 1 then the probability is normalized is normalized to 1 so the main point is that the state itself does not have a directly it does not have interpretation these coefficients a and b themselves don't have interpretation as probabilities but their absolute value square is what has interpretation as probability uh, that is one very important difference compared to classical probabilities because here the relative phase okay i should probably not call this a and a prime let me call this a and a prime not to confuse with the other previous discussion so here you will get a a prime star plus a star a prime so the the fact that you have two complex numbers that you are adding and their phases can be, may or may not be aligned is what gives rise to all kinds of interference effects in quantum mechanics and which is the origin of the wave like nature of particles and these two things are really actually very in a way very surprising because first of all complex number really play a very very crucial role in a description of real, real world you cannot do this without complex numbers and secondly you have a exactly linear structure i mean generically in physics you always encounter some non linearities so having an exactly linear structure where complex numbers are so having a linear vector space as the fundamental underlying structure of quantum mechanics is really one of the most surprising actually i think somebody dyson has said that this is one of the two biggest jokes that nature has played is that it has used complex numbers in a very fundamental way and linear structure in a very fundamental way okay let me now introduce one more concept and then we can move on to the field theory and then density matrix So given a state psi i can define a density matrix okay in this uh, dirac's notation which simply means uh, in the 2 by 2 matrix it's a 2 by 2 matrix in this case where you multiply a column vector with a row vector
And basically all the axioms of quantum mechanics I can state in terms of the density matrix instead of psi. For example, the probability axiom, the probability of obtaining a result i is given by this expectation value of the projector, which I can call is just write it as trace of rho times pi. And once again, it's clear that rho dagger is equal to rho. It's a self-adjoint operator. And trace rho in our normalization is 1. And one can define now something known as the von Neumann entropy. Which is just, just a definition minus trace rho log rho. Now it's clear that as, lo as long as rho is of this form, for example here, rho can be written as in some diagonal basis 1, 0, 0, right here. Because suppose I can choose psi to be uh, one of the basis vectors of an orthonormal basis. For example, if, for example, if rho is equal to plus plus, then in the matrix representation it looks like that. And therefore the trace rho log rho is 0, when you understand that 0 times log 0 is 0. Is this clear? So trace rho log rho is just eigenvalues pi log pi. And so pi is equal to 1, log 1, which is 0. And then it is 0 times log 0, which is 0. And that suggests a generalization Because our entire discussion started by assuming that we know in which state the physical system is in. But quite often we actually don't know which state the physical system is in. We might just have a probabilistic, I mean there are two kinds of probabilities that appear in quantum, I mean there is very fundamental probability that appears in quantum mechanics which has to do with measurement. That exists even if you knew exactly what the state you were talk, starting with. But there could be an additional source of uncertainty, which is more just a source of your lack of your knowledge. You may not know whether the state is really uh, this or this. We might know that maybe half the time it is this and half the time it is this. Yeah, we are going to come to that. You know, so that's going to be the main actor of our, in the black hole story. So entropy is a very fundamental concept and I want to sort of introduce it first in the simplest context and then hopefully uh, yeah but it's a major it's a uh, uh, so let me try to give some some uh, physical interpretation of it in this two state system already so one can therefore define a generalized density matrix preserving these two conditions and therefore, rho generically will take a form P1, P2 in some diagonal basis. Because since it's Hermitian, you can diagonalize it. And trace rho is equal to 1, so the probability is added. So P1, P1 plus P2 is equal to 1. And now it's clear that if, for example, you can take rho is equal to half, you 
in this basis. And what does that say? It says that I know that the system is plus in the plus state with probability half, and I know that the system is in minus state with probability half. I don't know more than that. And in that case, the von Neumann entropy is actually not zero, because you can now calculate it. It is half log half minus plus half log half. So it is log two. In fact, if I had used, since I'm using a natural logarithm is log two, if I had chosen a, in a binary log, in a, a log two, in the two bases, uh, if I chosen in base two, it would have been one. Okay, so in some units is log two. And this leads to a notion of pure state and a mixed state. that the von Neumann entropy here is zero, and here it is non-zero. Mixed state means that I know, only know the state to be in some probabilistic way, that it is in this state or in that state. I don't know exactly in which state it is. Now notice that even our state, the up state, here also we knew that the probability was half for plus and minus. But this is very different from this state because look at the row for this up, up state. If you calculate it, it was going to be like this, one, 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 one. It is not the same as this. Obviously, because you should be able to diagonal, in the diagonal basis, it will go to one, zero. Because after all, if I choose the, orthonormal basis, which is the eigen basis of the operator A, which is just the Pauli matrix sigma 1, in that basis, the de I can, uh, in that basis the density matrix should look like this. And therefore it's, uh, von Neumann entropy should be zero. And therefore it cannot be the same as this state. So you see that, in general, all the weird quantum behavior and the, what is called the coherent superposition, this, this is what I was referring to, the interference effects are contained in these off-diagonal elements of the density matrix. Of course, this is a basis independent statement, but the basis independent state, yeah, so this is a basis dependent statement. Sometimes it's about quantum coherence. Now let me give a, some kind of a physical interpretation of this. This is related to information theory, the concept introduced by So this is just again a, a side remark, but it could be important. I mean, keep it in mind, it's not absolutely essential to what we're going to discuss, but <coughs> the S is similar to the Shannon entropy. And Shannon's idea was very simple. Let's suppose you have, you're trying to communicate with somebody with a bit. So this, as I said, you can think of a classical bit, which is like on and off, instead of being plus and minus. Right? And if your bit is working perfectly, then your friend can really tell whether your light is on or off. 
and then you can communicate one bit of information. But it quite often can happen that your telephone line is not very good, or the, it's not so, it's foggy. And then your friend cannot tell whether the light is on or off, and can only tell whether the light is on with probability P1, and that it is off with probability P2. In that case, the amount of information you can communicate is not uh, log two, or one bit, but it is less than one bit. So the amount of information that you can communicate is I max, which is the dimension of your state space, which is log two in this case, log of the dimension, minus the entropy. So in our problem, it is just log 2 minus s. So in particular, if your bit was really defective and you cannot really tell whether it is on and off, you can only tell with 50% probability that it is on and off, then basically you cannot communicate any information, right? Because your friend cannot tell whether you are on or off, and so your Morse code will not work. So therefore, this is a very important connection which was, uh, so Shannon was a great uh, electrical engineer. Actually, it turns out that in this story of entropy, uh, two engineers really made fundamental contributions. One is Shannon, and other is Carnot, who we will encounter later on. So they really made, they were trying to solve some practical problem. Carnot was trying to design the most efficient steam engine, and he hit upon the concept of entropy. And Shannon introduced this information theoretic ideas into the notion of entropy. So you can see that increase in entropy will mean decrease in amount of information I can transmit. So that's kind of one physical interpretation of entropy. Is loss of information. And this will also, we will see that it's like increase in disorder. And this will relate to the second law of thermodynamics. Of course, a qubit is very different from Shannon's classical bit because there is no sense in which you can do a linear superposition with uh, complex things of an off and on. But if you have a spin system, it makes sense to have a linear superposition with complex coefficients, off and on. In both cases, they're normalized to one. The probabilities are normalized to one. But in one case, you're allowed to add complex numbers with phases, in the other case you are not. And this is the difference between quantum information theory and classical information theory, and that's a lot of the rage in quantum computing and quantum information really relies on these phases. And entropy sort of enters there in an interesting way. Okay, so for us, the entropy is going to be very critical. For physics, is actually, I would say, is one of the really very deep ideas which are sometimes not very appreciated because you learn it in uh, undergraduate studies and it's some, something to do with heat and, but it's really a very fundamental idea. Which gives a macroscopic window into the micro world.
And how that happens, I'm, that's what I will try to describe in the next hour. And that is how we want to use it, the entropy of black holes, also to learn about the microscopic world of quantum gravity. So this was one of the really most important insights of 19th century physics, I would say. I mean, along with maybe Maxwell's equations. In 19th century, you know, some of the kind of the great masters like Maxwell and uh, Boltzmann, I mean, of course I have to write Boltzmann first. Gibbs and Einstein and so on. They really used very deftly this notion of entropy and statistical reasoning to learn about the micro world by doing, talking about properties on a very macroscopic scale. At a time when you could not really look into the, for example, apparently one of the reasons that contributed to Boltzmann's suicide, which happened here, was that uh, nobody believed in the atomic hypothesis at that time. I mean, this was in 19th century, 1900. So a lot of the chemists didn't believe that the world is made up of atoms. So we are now glibly saying that, okay, this room is fill, filled with photons that is filled with atoms. How do we know if you don't have a microscope? How can we ascertain the quantum nature of matter? So in the 19th century, the quantum structure of matter you could look into through the use of entropy. So that's why the entropy is such an important idea. So even though you did not really have a micro microscope to resolve electrons and protons and so on, by indirect reasoning, a statistical reasoning, and using the notion of entropy and the relation between quantum statistical mechanics and thermodynamics, we could indirectly gain evidence for the reality of atoms. And that's the kind of thing that we want to do You want to study quantum structure of space-time or quantum gravity. And here it was done through the entropy of gases, ideal gases. Or entropy of harmonic oscillators, if you like. We will now study harmonic oscillator. We have been studying harmonic oscillator, the quantum oscillator. And one of the very important clues that allows us, so in some sense that we are in a similar situation like the 20, 19th century physicists that <coughs> the LHC is not good enough to probe the structure of space-time at the length scale that we want to, but can, we can still learn something about the quantum structure of space-time indirectly by studying the entropy of black holes. So that's why entropy of black holes and black holes are so important in the investigations of quantum gravity. And I just want to, you to be able to, it's of course not possible to <laughs> cover this whole thing in two lectures, but I want you to be able to appreciate uh, in reasonable detail that how it can be done. So the way entropy occurs in physics is through the notion of quantum ensembles. So we have been talking about states. But very often, like for the gas in this room, if you really seal everything and everything is thermally insulated, then only thing that we know about the gas in this room is the total energy. We don't know where precisely each molecule is. We don't know whether this, it, different molecules are going all over the place. So very often, we may know
so and now uh, from now on actually i'm going to talk when i talk about system i will think of a system of a mesoscopic size i mean a big enough size not one spin or two spins it's possible to actually formulate everything even for a single spin by using what is known as gibbs ensemble but i won't go into that I'm just think of a system which is large enough so that there are large lot large number of spins up and down so your hilbert space is big it's not just two dimensional it could be a product of many two dimensional spaces and in this case if you know the total energy there are many ways to like we saw for the harmonic i mean there are many ways you can distribute the energy for example i can have energy suppose only the total energy is known then i can think about the hilbert subspace So Hilbert subspace is just the st all states for which each size is equal to each size. So in this uh, two-state system, of course, there was it was the dimension was one. But generically, if you have lots of them, then one spin could be up, one, one, one guy could be plus E, another guy could be minus E, such that the total thing adds up to some big number, right? And then I can look at the dimension of the Hilbert subspace. And that also is what Boltzmann called the entropy, Boltzmann entropy. Okay, Boltzmann wrote it like that, sorry, log of this, sorry. Okay, let me write. And this is a very famous Boltzmann relation. Sometimes you'll see there is a factor k, but it's, it's it depends on some normalizations. But I'm trying to give it in the cleanest possible way. So yeah, so the, we were, all our temperature is measured in units of en energy. Then this Boltzmann constant, you can say to one. Now, what does this have to do with one Neumann entropy, a priori. Now, H of E is in most physical applications is finite dimensional. So, D of E are some finite integers. Then a fundamental postulate of quantum statistical mechanics, which, which what made all these things possible, was that in equilibrium, an isolated system, which means at, at fixed energy, has equal a priori probability of being in any of these microstates. So what is, what is meant by microstate? Microstate means any of these states, let me label them by R. So there can be a billion states with the same energy. For example, 
right? If you have a large, like in this case, in the case of, so is this clear? Or not? For example, if you took the, our two state system, so the Hamiltonian, let me call it small epsilon times one zero zero minus one. But if I take n copies of this, right, then there are many ways, given some total energy E, I can obtain it in many different ways, right? Suppose I have n copies of this, so I have total H is H1 plus H2, Hn. So this can be plus or minus epsilon, plus or minus epsilon. So total energy is plus or minus epsilon, plus or minus epsilon, plus or minus epsilon. So there are many possibilities in which I can realize a given energy E. And each of those possibilities will represent a unique state in the quantum Hilbert space. And that is known as a microstate. So microstate is simply an element of this Hilbert subspace. And this fundamental axiom of quantum statistical mechanics, now this is actually is not, uh, it depends in many systems, this, uh, so this is also known as ergodic hypothesis and so on. So there are, there is a big, there is a huge literature and there is a huge physics behind this, which I'm trying to summarize in, uh, in the minimal possible way. So it's not always true and so on and so on. There are caveats. But for a very large class of systems, this is a good axiom to go with. To be very uh, concrete, for example, if you think of this room as being filled with atoms, then you can have many different microstates in which one atom is going that way, another atom is going that way, and so on and so on. such that the total energy adds up to E, right? So you can see that there is a very large number of microstates corresponding to this entropy, uh, corresponding to these states. In this case, one can define a density matrix since it's unit probability, it's just going to be one along the diagonals divided by DE. And then the Boltzmann entropy is just minus trace lo rho log rho on this Hilbert subspace. So is this clear? Okay, let me take a pause because I think I have thrown a lot of things. Yeah, it's a uh, matrix of size DE by DE. Each with unit probability. So if you just calculate, it will be log DE times one upon d, times d. So it will add up to, with a minus sign, right? It will be one upon d, this, s is equal to minus, uh, sorry, minus of log of one upon d, which is log d.
So this is sometimes known as the microcanonical ensemble. Okay, so some historical name actually is not important. Which simply says that you have equal a priori probability of the system being in any of the microstates for a fixed energy. And actually, essentially, all of quantum statistical mechanics follows from this. Okay. So all the so one of the important things that follows from it, which you can derive from it actually, is the canonical ensemble which is kind of essential to make contact with thermodynamics. So here, for example, what you have is, suppose this is a bottle of wine. And it's sealed completely so that this energy is fixed. But now the canonical ensemble means that suppose you put that bottle of wine in a swimming pool and it's allowed to exchange heat with, uh, so we want to now make contact. So what is Boltzmann fundamental insight? This of course is just a definition, you know. I can always call log of DE to be S of E, it doesn't do anything. The fundamental insight is that he connected change in entropy, I mean in thermodynamics, has an independent notion of entropy. Going back to the engineer Carnot that I talked about. And his definition is that if you add heat, if you add energy to this, suppose you put a heater in this room and add energy to the heat, heat this room up at room temperature. Right, so the change in energy, you increase the energy if you add heat. Energy is, so if you increase the energy is, is equal to delta Q. But the change in entropy, he said, Carnot, is dQ upon T. Where T is the temperature. So temperature is not a, a fundamental, so, so far, I think a mathematician would be completely comfortable since you're talking about Hilbert spaces and so on and so on. It's all completely well defined. Temperature, on the other hand, is something that we feel, but it's a kind of a microscopic concept. And it doesn't have any fundamental representation in terms of, but it is related to how fast the molecules are moving. So tempera temperature is a macroscopic concept. having to do with thermodynamics, and somehow we have to understand it in the mic microscopic world, microscopic uh, description. And that's where the canonical ensemble comes in. Canonical ensemble says that if a system, instead of having it at fixed energy, like our wine bottle which is completely sealed, okay, so that it cannot exchange energy, is hermetically sealed. If a system can exchange heat, aha, uh -huh. uh, sorry. Uh, this temperature is measured in Kelvin. Yeah, that's why this degree Kelvin was introduced. You can always shift, yeah, you can always shift this and change this, but the notion of temperature in degree Kelvin appears in a very natural way, in, in this following, following way. If a system can exchange heat with a heat reservoir, at temperature T, then the probability 
that the system is in is in a microstate by R with energy E R is E to the minus beta E R. The beta is one upon T. Okay, so now look at the difference. This is this is called a canonical ensemble and this is called a microcanonical ensemble. Microcanonical ensemble, the total energy is fixed. So it's like a wine bottle which is completely sealed, wrapped up, and therefore it cannot exchange heat. And its energy is fixed. And in that case, all the molecules in the wine bottle could be, could be in many of these microstates, such that the total energy adds up to what the energy is. Here, the, now the wine bottle is in a swimming pool. Swimming pool could be at very high temperature, and the wine bottle is at 12 degrees. Then at equilibrium, system is a microstate, is at equilibrium, at thermal equilibrium. So now the wine bottle can absorb heat, can get heated up. If it was at 12 degrees from the refrigerator and you put it in the swimming pool of 25 degrees, it will uh, uh, get heat, it get heated up. And then the probability that the system is in a microstate psi r is given by ER. Okay? And I won't try to derive it because again it's a kind of a two lecture thing that one would have to do. Let me just quickly in indicate how the canonical ensemble is related to microcanonical ensemble is that you can now consider the total system of the wine bottle with the swimming pool as being totally insulated of fixed energy and asked a kind of a uh, probabilistic question that if the total energy is fixed to be E naught, what is the probability? And they are exchanging heat with each other. So that the total energy of the bottle plus the total energy of the swimming pool is fixed. Then what is the probability of finding the bottle in a state which has energy E bottle? Okay. That's the kind of a statistical question that you can do. And you can from that, if the system is large, is some kind of a saddle point evaluation and you can it's it's a bit like how how you prove the central limit here or something i mean it's a it's something that will be that you can derive only if the system is large and starting with the axiom of equal a priori probability you can derive the canonical ensemble So the net result is that in the canonical ensemble, the density matrix, I can in fact think of it as an operator, is simply e to the minus beta times the Hamiltonian. The density operator or density matrix. Divided by of course the total trace. Now we are no longer in, sorry, 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 sorry. We are no longer in the two-state system. In the canonical ensemble, And temperature is defined simply by del log del of Se, 1 upon the temperature. Beta is defined as
in some average, so the average energy, okay, so, okay, let me not, okay, let me, let me be a little bit. See, from here, you can define a part, so if you now look at just the unnormalized, we can define a partition function Z of beta, which is trace e to the minus beta h. Then it is equal to sum over all possible states with some density of states, so number of states times e to the minus beta i. So I can do it as a sum over energies, number of states with energy e, that this trace is equal to the number of states at energy e times, times e to the minus beta i. And then, sorry, no, so sub, it's a trace, right? So suppose I have many states with the same energy E. That's let omega E be the number of states. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I use DE, sorry, DE. Sorry, sorry, DE. Sorry, I use the different notation, sorry. Omega is used commonly in physics notation, I'm sorry. DE is the number of states, right? Is the dimension of the eigenspace. And here, now it's easy to see that the average energy is computed as just trace E, e to the minus, trace H. You can show that this is equal to basically, it's del logarithm of Z times del beta. So think of log of z beta as some function x of beta. Now, and we want to find, so this gives us energy, average energy as a function of beta, or average energy as a function of temperature. But if you, if you want to invert the relation and we want to get beta as a function of average energy, then the way to do it is that you define yeah, so E beta is defined as del X minus del X by del beta. Then one way to invert this is through the use of Legendre transform. So you define Y is equal to X plus E bar beta. And you have to now keep track of the, so del y by del e bar is equal to del x by del beta times del beta by del e bar plus beta plus e bar del beta by del e. And using the fact that e is equal to minus del x by del beta, this term and this term will cancel. So this is a standard trick in what is Legendre transform is when you have implicit function and you want to invert it. Then you define a Legendre transform. Now beta is defined as del y by del e bar. And now comes a step which I will not labor to justify here completely because there are five different derivations of this but I will just give you a flavor of it. The point is that D of E is a very rapidly growing function of energy because as you saw, for example, when you have to partition, the partitions, number of partitions of an integer, you know, it very rapidly grows with the number because there are really lots of ways you can split the total energy into its subsystems. So it's an extremely rapidly growing function. And the exponential beta is an extremely rapidly falling function. So it has a very sharp peak at E bar. 
which you can evaluate by a saddle point evaluation. Okay. We will come across this calculation in, in a, when we talk about the Hardy Ramanujan formula. Also, we will do a similar calculation. The first first term of that you can get by a saddle point evaluation. Okay, in physics literature, what is known as the Cardi formula. But the main point is that, so if I write, therefore it's e to the s e minus beta e bar evaluated at this bar is a good approximation to z of beta, which we said as e to the x. And how is this saddle point evaluation determined? It's determined by demanding that it's a saddle point, right? So you have to minimize this function. Minimize this function. So it's easy to see now, x beta is plus beta e bar is s e bar. So therefore, y is equal to s. And therefore, beta is equal to del s by del e, or in other words, this is the first law of thermodynamics, or ds by de, that de is equal to t ds, which is a 1 upon t. So if you use So this really is a very critical point which makes the connection between micro and the micro. Because now, entropy has an independently, sorry, this is average energy. Because we can only talk about average energies. If you have a wine bottle in a, in a swimming pool, its energy is not fixed because it is exchanging energy with the swimming pool. But its average energy is fixed and it's pretty sharply peaked. So it doesn't really make a difference whether it's, we talk about the average energy or total energy because it's extremely sharply peaked. So you don't, the fluctuations, the statistical fluctuations are so small that you can, there are situations when the statistical fluctuations become big and that's a whole field of statistical physics but in, in a situation like this, the fluctuations are so small that whether you talk about the total energy or average it doesn't make any difference. So that's the key point now. We have, so I'll summarize now. We have connected S, which is equal to log E, log DE, and I'm henceforth going to blur the distinction between E and E bar. The average energy is more or less the same as the total energy, is actual energy. Such that where S E is precisely what appears in the first law of thermodynamics. So what is the first law of thermodynamics? First law of thermodynamics simply says that energy is conserved. So if I heat this room, then the energy must increase by the same amount as the heat that I'm adding. You cannot, all that heat must go into some energy, otherwise energy is not conserved. And then by Carnot's relation, this is equal to T, T delta S, which is the same as this relation. So this is how, why entropy is so fundamental in our discussions, because now, by doing a something very accounting problem, this is what number theorists like to do, 
or this is how it makes connections with our modular forms and so on story, because there we are doing a counting problem. But the counting problem by this long chain of reasoning is related to a very physical quantity, namely the amount of heat you are adding to the system and some thermodynamic property of the system. And so now, even if you cannot have a microscope, you can determine how, whether or not your microscopic model of the world is correct or not. And for that, I will now take one example going back to quantum field theory. So this actually summarizes my discussion of quantum mechanics and quantum statistical mechanics and entropy. So, which is a long, which requires usually three or four courses, but okay. I think I have, I hope I have conveyed all the essential concepts, right? I mean, everything so far is well defined, I hope. Apart from, okay, we have some issues with the finer, the way to put things properly. Exactly, that's what I'm going to do next. And now you will see how we connect to quantum fields. And we will derive Planck's distribution law, one of the most famous, most celebrated results in quantum statistical mechanics, by doing quantum, quantum harmonic oscillators. So I said last time that for most practical purposes, essentially, so, so let me qualify the, my statement so that I don't make a wrong statement. In perturbative QFT, what is known as perturbative quantum field theory, which actually is good enough to describe essentially everything except for the nuclear force. So all of quantum electrodynamics, all of weak interactions, electroweak theory, falls in this class of perturbative quantum field theory, which means that <coughs> essentially uncoupled, which means that a quantum field can be thought of as an essentially uncoupled, or very weakly coupled, harmonic oscillators, quantum oscillators. And to a good approximation, you can just treat them to be just exactly harmonic oscillators. And the interactions correspond to unharmonicities. So for example, if you recall our harmonic oscillator, it had the equation of motion dA by dt is equal to omega A and similarly, similar equation for A dagger. Oh, sorry, maybe it's A and dA dagger by dt is equal to minus omega A dagger. And if you wrote A is equal to, let's say, Q plus IP divided by square root of 2, I had put some factors of omega there to be consistent with the physics conventions, but let's just do it like that. You think of A as a complex number in a two-dimensional plane, right? And what this is telling you is that it's rotating. That's the harmonic motion. So this number is rotating because what is the solution of this? A is equal to A0 e to the minus i omega t. And if I write this in terms of real and imaginary coordinates like that, then you can see that it satisfies the harmonic equation, the famous harmonic oscillator that you have seen in school. You can check that d, d square q by dt square 
equal to minus omega square q. If you just plug it in here, because of this i, right, you can work this out, right? I mean, you will have basically dq by dt plus i dp by dt equal to omega dq by d, sorry, omega q plus ip. And then it depends, I want to eliminate this. So I take one more derivative and I use this equation. And you can convince yourself that you get this equation. Now if I wrote it on this side, if I take And unharmonicity, see this is a linear equation in Q. I can have unharmonicities which are like lambda Q cube or something like that. And all my discussion is valid when lambda is much smaller than 1 in some perturbative sense. So basically you can drop this term, solve this equation and treat this lambda q cube as a perturbation and that's basically all of quantum field theory that is required for quantum electrodynamics you can do in this language just in terms of harmonic oscillators. Okay, you have to be a little bit, it's not the best way to do it, if you, most efficient way of doing it, but conceptually is the simplest way to think about it. Conceptually it's completely correct to think about the electromagnetic field is just a collection of harmonic oscillators. And the Dirac electron field is a collection of harmonic oscillators of a different kind. And they are interacting with, so you, you can have a, more than one harmonic oscillators and they're interacting with each other. And uh, the interaction is small. That's what we meant by perturbative quantum field theory. So now coming back to Sheria's question, let's look at the photons electromagnetic field. Now the electromagnetic field, last time I wrote down, the electromagnetic field actually in, in four dimensions has two polarizations, okay? So the, the electromagnetic field is actually a mu as we saw, it's a connection one form. If you drop this term, then what you get is very similar to a wave equation. If you, if you have now k harmonic oscillators, some large number of harmonic oscillators, where k could be a momentum vector. Then for each of them, I will get a harmonic oscillator equation. And where does this momentum vector come from? If you had a field phi of t and x, so we descri describe fields, right? So a scalar field. In d plus one dimension. Then I can define DDK, okay, this is some normalization which is not important. Okay, it's normalized in this way, okay, to the power half, okay. 
some normalization. The important point is a k e to the i k dot x minus i i k dot x plus a k dagger e to the minus i k dot x. So there is a, there are different ways to think about it. You can start with a scalar field which satisfies the klein gordon equation as we saw. So klein gordon equation would be something like minus del by del t square plus del square of x phi of x t is equal to 0. And if you now do a Fourier decomposition of phi, then you see this will turn into you can bring down this derivative and it will look exactly like this equation. Each of the phi k's satisfy exactly a harmonic oscillator equation. Where omega k is just the absolute value of k of the vector k. Sorry. Yeah, so all that, I, the point that I want to make is that a field which satisfies a wave, wave equation, a quantum field, a classical field which satisfies a wave equation. So there are two ways to do it. I think last time it was also raised, why don't we do the canonical quantization? The point is that a field in d plus one dimensions can be thought of as a collection of harmonic oscillators, quantum oscillators. I mean, if you have a quantum field, it's a quantum oscillator. If it's a classical field, it's a classical oscillator of frequencies omega k for every so k is a d dimensional vector d dimensional spatial vector So I'm not doing something fancy. I'm just doing Fourier analysis because I want to solve a wave equation in flat space. But there is a generalization of this to curved space time, which, OK, I may not get time to do it. But it's also pretty straightforward, and which also you can state in terms of harmonic oscillators. That I want to solve an equation like that minus del square by del t square plus grad square acting on phi is equal to 0. And the natural thing to do is to do a Fourier analysis. And then if phi goes as e to the minus i omega t, let's say, and e to the i k dot x, then one of the modes of this is will sa satisfy the equation that minus omega square, uh, something is wrong. Uh, plus omega square minus k square. This implies that omega is equal to omega k from the equation of motion. So this is the intuitive idea that I had discussed and you are familiar with that I think of the electromagnetic wave as a collection of light going in this direction, going in that direction. So that is a wave vector. And the magnitude of the wave vector determines the frequency of light. So if it is red light, the frequency is uh, different. If this blue light, then the frequency is higher. And so as you sp uh, span the whole spectrum, you can get all kinds of frequencies. So now this room, if you think of it as, now we want to follow the statistical mechanics. 
and want to derive the average energy of the gas of photons using exactly the calculation that we did last time. And last time, we computed, and these harmonic oscillators are completely independent of each other. So you remember, we did a single harmonic oscillator, and then we did a multiple harmonic oscillator. But that was trivial, because you just take the tensor product of the Hilbert spaces, the Hamiltonian just adds. So calculations are completely tr trivial. And if you remember, the partition function z of beta for a single harmonic oscillator, z of q, I had called it. For a single harmonic oscillator, labeled by k. So my total Hamiltonian now is omega k hk, summed over k. Of course, I'm writing it as a discrete sum, but you should really understand it as some d cube k. I'm just summing over the energies of all. And here is this very interesting thing, beautiful thing about the harmonic oscillator, the quantum oscillator, which now is what makes the particle interpretation correct, uh, uh, possible. You recall that for each mode, each harmonic oscillator, I had a Fock vacuum. Right, so I had an oscillator, let's say, AK and AK dagger, whose product was one, sorry, whose commutator was one, AK commutes with itself. In fact, I can put a prime here and I can put a delta function, this is true. If I have multiple and the very nice thing about the harmonic oscillator was the Hamiltonian was just omega k times a dagger k, a k plus half. And this we recognize as a number operator. In fact, if you remember, the Hilbert space representation of this algebra is based on, it's a Fock representation, it's called the Fock representation, based on a Fock vacuum. And then we had all these states. I could act with it AK dagger and zero. That was my state one. And in fact, I had a representation of the state NK as AK dagger to the power NK. And the important point was that n acting on nk was an integer. And therefore Hamiltonian, therefore it is, can be identified as a state with n particles. So somehow this very simple looking system, undergraduate level system, is what makes it possible to view a quantum field as a collection of particles. Because particles, if they are non-interacting, I should be able to just add them. Their energy should add, right? So if I have a H, this overall, this is just some uh, shift in the origin of the energy. But every time I go up in NK, the energy goes up by omega k. So 
that means if nk goes up by 1, the energy goes up by omega k. See, so this is very important that the energy levels, eigen levels, are integer spaced. Energy eigenvalues of the harmonic oscillator. And therefore, a quantum field, which is just a collection of harmonic oscillators, its Fox space representation can be equivalently interpreted as, so for example, I can now take the most general state, AK1 dagger to the power NK1, AK2 dagger to the power NK2, to some ak whatever your number you want, akn to the power nkn on the Fock vacuum with some normalization. Then this represents nk1 photons with wave vector k1 and so on. So therefore, any state of the electromagnetic field in this room, I can represent in this way. It's just five green photons going that way and six blue photons going that way. So what do I have to do? I just choose k to be that direction and says so that the k square is the frequency of the green light and another k to be of that direction and I take nk1 to be five and nk2 to be six. Moreover, it's a system of independent harmonic oscillators. So I can just compute the partition function very trivially, and which we already did. Last time we called it q to the power h k. If I, I'm assuming of course that q is less than one and so on. And then I get a geometric series. There is an overall e to the minus beta omega k over two which as we saw in some cases is important, but for our current discussion is not so important. And then it's one minus Q to the N, right? This was, so it's one minus E to the minus beta omega K. For a single harmonic oscillator, right? And what is the average energy? You can calculate it's minus del log z del beta. It's a small calculation which you can do, which turns out to be h omega, I mean sorry, omega k e to the beta omega k minus one. And you probably, if you remember Planck's distribution law, this is already Planck's distribution law, if you remember from your, if you have vague memories of the undergraduate course, you did. Yes. No, so, so uh, I'm sure you will get confused because quantum field theory appears in many, many contexts. And that was a one plus one dimensional system. Now I'm talking about a three plus one dimensional system. Also, that one plus one dimensional can be the space time in which you live. Or it, yeah, so that context was 24 bosons in one plus one dimensions.
beta is 1 upon t. In, in our calculation there, uh, beta was, uh, e to the minus beta was q. But then, of course, we wanted to make q complex if you want to think about modular forms. But if you want to think it in terms of the physical system of a one, so that system corresponded to, instead of living in three dimensions, suppose you lived in a one dimension, our system there was one dimension, it was on a circle though, which is why k was not continuous. See here, you have an integral d cube k. There we had a sum, and we had time. So you could think of them as photons traveling along this direction. And their frequencies happen to be, so it so happened that because k in one dimension is uh, n over l, if l is the length, if this is the 2 pi length of 2 pi l, your Fourier integral in that case became a Fourier sum. And omega k happened to be just proportional to k which is just n, if we put L is equal to 1. So we had in that case an infinite set of oscillators whose frequency were themselves integer spaced. So there were two integer spacings, right? These excitations are integer spaced, but also their frequencies were integer spaced. So you had one oscillator with frequency like that, the other oscillator what frequency twice this, and the third oscillator with frequency three times this. So you had an infinite collection of such oscillators, and 24 varieties of them, and that's what gives rise to 1 upon delta. 1 upon delta now becomes beta goes in there. Could be identified, could be identified with the temperature, 1 upon the temperature. And in fact, one can derive the Cardi formula, or the, the exponential growth of the Hardy Ramanujan formula from this point of view. Uh, why it goes the square root of n? Because it's you can think of it as one plus one dimensional thermodynamics. Okay, I'm, yeah, I'm sure this is going a bit too fast, but So the thing is that, notice that, so therefore the total energy, average energy, which is going to be sum over the average energies of each of these guys, summed over k, all possible wave vectors. And the all possible wave vectors is it's easy to think of it, put it in a finite volume, and then you take volume to go to infinity limit. So basically, k is going to be divided by 2 pi, say, l, a vector like that, 2 pi n1, sorry, n1 divided by l, n2 divided by l, n3 divided by l, so on. So 2 pi n1 divided by l. If I, my length of the box is l. Okay, I called it l there. Let me call it r. And this, so basically it's a set of points right in a three dimensional space with a separation between them as 2 pi upon r if r is the size of this room. And then as standard you can sort of convert this integral into a in the large r limit. You can convert this sum into an integral. Using the fact that delta k, 2 pi r, right? So you can basically write it as delta k, times, so basically you can write e bar is equal to d cube k, r cube divided by 2 pi cube times omega k, e to the beta omega k minus 1. So this is just the volume of the room. 
So the energy density, therefore, is proportional to this quantity, which is the famous Planck distribution law. Now, what do we notice that beta was 1 upon k, 1 upon t, and omega k was absolute value of k. So, this is nothing but k square dk times k divided by e to the k over t minus 1. So, we immediately see that the energy density, I can divide by t here and take out a t to the 4 outside as the form eta square eta cube d eta e to the eta minus 1, where eta is equal to k upon t. And this is the famous Stefan Boltzmann law that now we have derived that if I hit this room, the energy density will go as the fourth power of the temperature. So this is the promised uh, window into the microstructure. Now this you can check. And this is, this is a, all the experiments in black body radiation going back to Kirchhoff's and so on and so on. They were checking the frequency dependence and the temperature dependence. And now, and it is true that the average energy density scales as the fourth power of the temperature. And in fact you can see that if you are in d plus one dimensions, it will scale as the t to the power d plus 1. In two dimensions, it will, in one plus one dimensions, it will scale as t square, average energy density. And average entropy density will scale as v was the total volume of the room. Because if the volume is infinite, the energy is infinite, right? So, <coughs> so you can only talk about energy density in this room. But this is a really remarkable thing that we had a micro. This implies that the microscopic model of the electromagnetic radiation. as a collection of harmonic oscillators. Makes a very sharp prediction through Boltzmann's, and you can similarly check that the entropy scales as T cube. Implies that energy density scales as T to the power D plus one in d, in d plus 1 dimensions. And uh, entropy density scales as t to the power d. So in this sense, I can measure this now. Right? I put a heater, and if I increase the, so this is the amount of heat that I have to add. If I want to increase the temperature in this room, by some factor, the amount of, uh, say, if I need to double the temperature, I need to add eight times. So the scaling is, you can verify very easily. And in fact, now one can very precisely verify also the frequency dependence. So this is my, kind of my, today's uh, conclusion, I think, okay, I succeeded in doing something today. It's a micro wind macro window into the microscopic world.
Okay, let me see if I'm getting it right. And in our, uh, you remember we had a one plus one dimension. We had computed Z of Q for a collection of harmonic oscillators, which was some, let's say, one upon delta Q. But you can have many other things possible. It is well known that d of n, which you can expand as d of n q to the n, and d of n as a scaling is e to the square root of n, with some coefficient that is depends on the details of the modular form. But what is this? This is the Scaling of this is e to the entropy at large n. And you can see that there is a simple physical understanding of this, namely, entropy scale scales as the temperature in uh, one, one plus one dimensions. And energy scales as t squared. Therefore, entropy scales as square root of the energy. And if you remember, n was the eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian. Indeed. So that's exactly the. So this calculation will actually come up exactly. Identical calculations or very similar calculations will come up in the. So, let me give you a preview of what we will do next time. So, just to summarize, what we saw is that if I didn't know anything about the. So, we started with the atomic hypothesis that the world is made up of atoms, which means the world is made up of quantum fields. Okay, it's all big words. But Therefore, I have a microscopic model of the light in this room or the photon gas in this room. And if that atomic hypothesis is correct, then that microscopic model implies that I have these infinite number of harmonic oscillators with frequencies given in this particular way. And then just following the statistic, quantum statistical reasoning, you conclude that the average energy in this room should scale as t to the 4 with this very precise Planck distribution law as a scaling with frequencies. And this you can verify. For quantum black holes, so there were two things that were required for this to be a useful enterprise. That we had an independent way of determining the entropy as temperature to the cube, right? We had some way of measuring the average energy in this room by putting a thermometer, right? And we can check whether it goes up as a, which power of temperature as it goes up as I heat the room, right? So we required a macro side and a micro side. In the case of the room, the macro side was a heater and the micro side was a model of photons. And we verified that average energy density goes as t to the 4. In the case of black holes, the micro side is basically general relativity. Micro side is always quantum mechanics or quantum field theory. And it's going to be a black hole solution of general relativity. And on this side, it's going to be some brain configuration, which I will explain next time. Or maybe today also I can explain in the remaining minutes. And here there is an independent calculation just from the geometry of 
the black hole, you have a notion of Bekenstein Hawking entropy. And in this side, it's a counting problem of some Hilbert subspace. of the brain system <coughs> and I will, okay this brain system might sound a bit uh, uh, strange but I will try to demystify it in a moment. So this is some problem in enumerative geometry. Okay, and this turns out to be related to some Euler character of some moduli space. And it's related to various modular forms. Fourier coefficients of modular forms. So just like our counting problem for the photons was this very simple problem of, right? This problem, right? This problem is actually very generic. In fact, this problem, this is the kind of thing that Gauthier did, for example, he, when he was computing the modulus, some piece of uh, Euler character of the elliptic genus, oh, sorry, Euler character of symmetric products of K3, he got this kind of uh, object. Because of the Euler character of a single K3 is 24. And if you have symmetric product, they basically behave like bosons. Because they're symmetric, symmetric, they commute with each other. And therefore, that counting problem is actually related to bosons. Because they, are, they all have even cohomology. If you had odd cohomology, then they have to come up with some minus signs. And they are related to what we will call fermions, which I'll do next time. So basically, all this technology that we used is very directly related to this counting problems of various moduli spaces. And let me now very quickly uh, say what is a brain system and then I will stop. So what, for our purposes, you don't need to know anything about various D brains and this and that. So we, we said that there is a space-time manifold. Which was say M1 comma D. Right? In string theory, the typical M1 comma D is, for example, you encounter is M1 comma 9, which can be some M1 comma 4 times some Calabria 3, some six manifold, which is a Calabria threefold, something like that. Huh? M1 three, sorry. Now inside this M1 D, you can have a sigma one comma p sitting inside an M1 D. Okay, just some. You can think of it as some homology cycle, some complicated homology cycle inside this, or just some plane, a p-dimensional plane in a d-dimensional space. Now we have been discussing quantum fields uh, on M1D, right? So we, so let me say that the coordinates of this are sigma mu. Or sigma alpha, and the coordinates of this are x mu. So x mu is equal to your time x0 and x. So mu goes from 0 to d, whereas sigma alpha goes from sigma 0 and then a sigma vector, which is so alpha goes from 0 to p. So such an object is called a p brain. 
is the generalization of, if you had a, a string, if you had a point particle, it's a zero brain. If you had a one dimensional sigma, then it's a one brain. And there is a more general, general notion of a P brain. But of course, it's not just the homology cycle. The point is that there is a quantum field theory which is living on that. So, and I think this is what, so it's, it's like a, you have to think in terms of sheaves or something like that. Because for example, you can have a connection, one form which is localized on this. So quantum field theory on sigma 1 comma p belonging inside an m1 comma d such as young mills theory i mean this uh, theory of connection one forms so by theory i mean there was a hamiltonian that we wrote down some equations of motion that we wrote down one forms of group g of say u1 let's say to, to, be, to, to be very simple then the by theory i mean the equations of motion so a now lives a mu d sigma mu a is localized onto this brain and the equations of motion the hamiltonian equations of motion are just i write f is equal to df this is the maxwell equation in uh, p plus one dimension the bianca identity is this and the maxwell equation is d star f is equal to zero so this system describes a theory on a p brain and you can have different brains with different quantum numbers or different quantum field theories and so on so there is a whole variety of things so the simplest quantum field theory that we considered was a one brain with 24 scalar, scalar fields, phi of sigma and tau, with some label i, i going from 1 to 24. And that's what gives rise to this 1 upon delta q. So this is how, uh, this is what I will try to describe next time, that somehow, in the same way that we were able to understand, get some insight about the microscopic world about, of matter, microscopic structure of matter, by just you know, heating the room and measuring the temperature without really having a microscope. In the same way, one can actually learn <coughs> about quantum gravity by studying black holes and their entropy, because then we have to be able to explain that entropy as logarithm of something else. Logarith logarithm of some dimension of some Hilbert subspace. And that counting problem of dimension of Hilbert subspace is very interesting mathematically because it is related to all kinds of interesting enumerative geometry problems. And very often they assemble themselves into modular forms. And that again is not an accident, it's related to the fact that we are dealing with a conformal field theory. So, we saw last time that we got this weird uh, 1 to the 24. Uh, I mean, it was really important that that ground state energy somehow could be renormalized or uh, regularized using the zeta function. And the fact that the minus 1 upon 24 came out the way it came out was because if you want to maintain conformal invariance, then that's the, that, that answer is uniquely determined. And uh, so I think I'll stop here. Yeah, so the, typically the black, the brain will be some cycle inside this case, uh, this six dimensional manifold. So think of this four dimensional, the 10 dimensional manifold in string theory.
is say some M1, 3. And at each point, there is a K6. And if this brain is some complicated cycle wrapping something, some brain cycle wrapping in this K6, then in four dimensions it looks like a point. And, but there is a Newton's, there is a coupling constant which I have been setting to, taking it to be small. Right, we have been treating free field theories. There is a way to increase the coupling constant, in which case the Newton's constant becomes large, and this point sort of swells up into a black hole. But because you can go from here to there by continuously varying that coupling constant, you expect that you should be able to compute the degeneracies. Yeah, and then, then you have a nice metric on it, which is what I will describe next time. So once the coupling constant becomes large, this brain configuration which is localized at a point, swells up into a black hole. And that geometry I can work out by solving some differential equations. And that entropy I can calculate. And by some continuity arguments which are actually subtle because of wall crossing and so on, and that's where the whole mock modular story comes in. But that's roughly the intuition that you should be able to discover. Okay, I think I'll stop here.